St Peter's Church in Drogheda, County Louth, contains what has to be one of the most unsettling religious relics on display anywhere in the world. The church is famous because it has a human head of an Irishman, Oliver Plunkett, who was hanged, drawn and quartered before being beheaded in London in 1681. For religious Catholics, the head of Oliver Plunkett, who was later declared a saint, is believed to have supernatural powers and can cure illnesses and perform miracles. However, this wasn't always the case. The story of how the decapitated head of a man executed in the most barbaric manner possible was transformed into one of Ireland's most popular religious relics in the mid-20th century is intriguing. It's wrapped up in the story of 17th century religious wars, Catholic emancipation and Ireland's struggle for independence in the 20th century. Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWire and this is Making a Martyr, the story of Oliver Plunkett. There's a busy few weeks coming up for the show in the next month. Partisans returns next week. That's the series on Irish stories from the Spanish Civil War. Now, if all goes according to plan, there'll be five episodes to conclude that series over just two and a half weeks. So you'll be getting two episodes a week in the coming weeks. So it might be a good time to check out the first four episodes in Partisans. You'll find them in the back catalogue dating from December 2019. It's worth saying that all this work is supported by listeners like you at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. Because of their support, I've been able to more than double production of the show since social distancing and social isolation began. I know lots of you aren't in a position to support the show at the moment, but if you are, now is a great time. Working without access to libraries means I have to buy a lot more books than I normally do. You can find out how Patreon works at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast podcast. Now to Oliver Plunkett. I will say this episode needs a warning for younger listeners or parents if you're listening with little ears around. The show opens with a description of an execution that's not suitable for younger audiences. So our story of this strange relic, the 300 year old head of Oliver Plunkett, begins in the chaotic and violent 17th century with an execution that is truly the stuff of nightmares. It took place on July the 11th, 1681. The condemned man was Oliver Plunkett. I'll explain a little later why he was condemned, but for now all that concerns us is his execution. On July the 11th, 1681, he was brought from his cell in the Newgate Prison in London. Accounts of the time all talk of how calm he remained, which is pretty astonishing given the day he was about to have. He was due to be executed at Tyburn, the notorious execution ground outside the city of London. Now, while thousands had been hanged at Tyburn, a far worse fate awaited Plunkett. He was to suffer hanging, drawing and quartering. The punishment began when Plunkett was tied to a horse and dragged through the streets of London. At Tyburn, he would astonish the crowd by forgiving those involved in his execution. Fear alone would have silenced most. The ordeal began when a noose was placed around his neck and he was hanged. However, he was cut down before he expired. This led to the most horrific aspect of the execution. While he was still alive, the executioner removed his intestines and other body parts. Plunkett's excruciating agony was only ended when he was eventually beheaded. To complete the humiliation, his body was then cut up into several pieces and his head turfed on a fire. In a brutal indictment of the time, Plunkett's execution was by no means enough to earn him more than a passing reference in a history book. However, he would go on to become one of the most famous Irish people ever executed. Indeed, so much so, you could argue, a second life of sorts began the moment Oliver Plunkett lost his head. To understand this, though, first I need to talk a little bit about who precisely Oliver Plunkett was and why he had ended up at Tyburn. So Plunkett was born at Loch Crewe in County Mead in 1625. His family were wealthy and most importantly Catholics in a time where Catholics across England and Ireland faced increasing persecution. In 1647, Oliver travelled to Rome to study. Seven years later, he was ordained a priest in 1654. Although all Irish priests at the time had to make a commitment to return to Ireland once they were ordained to carry out what was dangerous work of preaching to the faithful, Oliver Plunkett received an exemption. He was kept on at the papal court in Rome to continue his studies. This was unquestionably the safer option, 
Cromwell had invaded Ireland in 1649 and war, famine and disease had devastated the island. Being a priest was extremely dangerous work. Ultimately, Oliver Plunkett remained in the papal court at Rome for over 20 years. Then, in 1669, he successfully lobbied the Pope to be appointed Archbishop of Armagh. After his ordination as Archbishop, he travelled back to Ireland. Life was certainly easier than it had been in the 1650s for Catholics. The anti-Catholic climate of the Cromwellian invasion had eased. Cromwell himself was dead and his followers had been driven from power when the monarchy was restored. Plunkett based himself in the town of Dundalk and began the work of rebuilding the Catholic Church in Ireland, which had been devastated by years of persecution. However, what had been the more tolerant climate of the late 1660s was replaced by an increasing repression of Catholics in the 1670s. Plunkett had to spend more and more time in hiding. In 1678, the situation got even worse due to a conspiracy theory called the Popish Plot. Although it was entirely fabricated, it claimed Catholics were conspiring against the king. It unleashed a wave of persecution across England, Scotland and Ireland. Plunkett was arrested in 1679 and initially tried in Dundalk in July 1680 for his supposed role in the Popish Plot. The charges included treason, which carried a death sentence by hanging, drawing and quartering. The first trial, however, collapsed, but to Plunkett's dismay, he was sent to London for what was little more than a show trial. The royal prosecutors gave him five weeks to get witnesses who could testify in his defence. However, given these people would have to travel from Ireland, covering such distances in the 17th century, in five weeks was nigh on impossible. Even though no witnesses arrived in time, the prosecution pushed ahead with the trial. Presumably accepting his fate, Oliver Plunkett offered little by way of a defence other than pointing out that he should have been tried in Ireland. It made little difference and he was sentenced to the brutal death we have already heard about. While Plunkett was clearly a Catholic martyr, this was not unique at the time. The 17th century was a period of intense religious persecution and indeed he was only one of dozens of executions resulting from the Popish Plot conspiracy. What perhaps made his case stand out from the others was that he was the last Catholic martyr executed in England. However, this was not really reason enough to give him fame after his death. This would take a series of bizarre, indeed macabre events, a period when he was almost entirely forgotten, and then a huge change in politics and religious attitudes in Ireland. Next, we will look at what was possibly the most important of these, the strange macabre events that followed his death. After his execution, the body parts of Oliver Plunkett were in accordance with his own wishes buried in the cemetery of St Giles in the field near Tyburn in London. He had chosen this because the remains of several other Catholic martyrs were buried in the cemetery. However, crucially, a few parts of his body were kept separately. His head, which had been tossed into a fire after he had been beheaded, had been rescued by his friends. I couldn't find out precisely what was done to it, but someone had clearly embalmed it and preserved it. Then, for some reasons that to me are totally inexplicable, a surgeon removed his arms at the elbow and his hands and forearms were not buried but instead placed in a box with his head. After this, the various body parts, some in a grave at St Giles in the field and the rest in storage above ground, remained in England for two years. Then, in 1683, one of the many exhumations of his body took place and the bones of Oliver Plunkett were brought with the head to Landsbringa in Lower Saxony in Germany. There, the bones, excluding the head and forearms, were buried in the grounds of a local Benedictine monastery and the head itself was carried on to the papal court in Rome. In Rome, over the coming years, Oliver Plunkett's head passed between various custodians, including the exiled English cardinal Philip Howard, who had known Plunkett. Howard died in 1694 and his Zucchetto, the hat cardinals, where was placed on the embalmed head. After this, the head and the Zucchetto next passed into the care of an Irish priest, Hugh McMahon, who was studying in Rome at the time. When he returned to Ireland to take up the position of Archbishop of Armagh, he brought Oliver Plunkett's head with him. While he looked after it initially, at some point in the following two decades, maybe around the year 1725, the head was transferred to Drogheda, where it was placed in the care of the Siena Order of Nuns in the town. The mother superior in the convent at the time was Catherine Plunkett, a grandniece of the executed Oliver. In recent years, researchers David Atherton and Michael Payton contacted the archivist of the Siena Order, who explained, We do not know exactly when it arrived on our walls, 
but certainly after the sisters had moved from their mud cabin near the River Boyne to the first convent in Dyer Street. But we have no data allowing us to know when this move took place. Probably between 1725 and 1737, the year of the death of Hugh McMahon, Archbishop of Armagh, who bequeathed the relic to our community, as can be read in his last will. The Siena convent, however, was an enclosed order, meaning the nuns had no contact with the outside world. While they did facilitate people who wanted to see the head, Oliver Plunkett began to fade into obscurity in Ireland in the 18th and early years of the 19th century. This would all change when the head gained political and religious value as Irish society began to change. While Catholics in Ireland had suffered over a century of formal discrimination under the law, this all came to an end when Catholic emancipation was finally passed in 1829. This was followed by a period of resurgence for the Catholic Church in Ireland. Indeed, many of the churches you see across the country today date from this period. This was also an age where Irish nationalism emerged as a major force again, a movement that became increasingly linked to the Catholic Church as the 19th century progressed. This created what was a perfect climate where Oliver Plunkett's wider story, and indeed his embalmed head, gained huge propaganda value. No Irish person had been canonised that's declared a saint since the 13th century and the Catholic Church in Ireland increasingly saw Plunkett as a potential propaganda coup for them. If he was declared a saint, it would cement their growing power in Ireland. Likewise, in the later 19th century, he also fitted into an emerging political narrative among nationalists, given his execution could neatly fit into the idea that Irish people had been persecuted at the hands of the English for centuries. If anything, the head was existing, if not living, proof of this. However, getting someone declared a saint by the papacy was by no means straightforward. It was usually a lengthy process, taking decades, but in the 1860s this process began. Even though he remained a marginal figure in terms of the wider public, the Catholic Church began to research into the life of Plunkett. This gained pace in the 1880s, around the 200th anniversary of his execution. The anniversary drew attention to the fact that the German monastery where he had been reburied back in 1683, had been closed down by the King of Prussia in 1803, and the community of English Benedictines who ran the institution had moved back to the UK. Therefore, in 1883, in a move that added to the growing awareness of his story, the headless and armless skeleton of Oliver Plunkett was exhumed for a second time and was brought back to England, and the bones were put on display in a public shrine at the Benedictine Monastery at Downside in Somerset. These efforts succeeded in getting Plunkett on the road to sainthood, when in 1886 the Pope of the time, Leo XIII, declared him venerable, the first step. Around this time, the church hierarchy in Ireland had realised the potential publicity value of Oliver Plunkett's head in Drogheda and started investigating the possibility of having him removed from the confines of the Siena convent to a new, more public location. This started decades of wrangling between the Siena order of nuns who wanted to keep the head of Oliver Plunkett and the Archbishop of Armagh, who wanted to put it on display in a more public setting. All the while, the campaign to have him declared a saint was growing. He was formally declared a martyr in 1918 and beatified in 1920, all key steps, although having him declared a saint was still a long way off. For this, the church needed proof he had performed miracles, which was tricky given he was dead 300 years. In the early 20th century, Plunkett's reputation was aided by the War of Independence, given he was a perfect symbol of an Irish person unjustly killed in England. Indeed, his popularity had grown to such an extent that the IRA in Drogheda during the War of Independence were increasingly concerned that the Black and Tans would try and steal the head. They would even organise to have patrols in the streets around the Siena convent, where the head was still being held. However, Plunkett would ultimately not remain in that convent for long. The Archbishop of Armagh successfully petitioned the papacy to have it removed from the convent to the Church of St. Paul, which had recently opened in Drogheda before the First World War. Appeals from the Siena nuns who had looked after Oliver Plunkett's head for nearly two centuries were ignored and in the summer of 1921 it was moved to the church and put on public display in Drogheda for all the world to see. Plunkett's head began to attract huge numbers of Catholics, not least because of the rumours and stories that surrounded it. It was increasingly claimed that the head had supernatural powers and that it was preserved not due to any embalming process but because of Plunkett's incorruptible flesh. By the mid-20th century, the head was firmly associated with cures and miracles. 
people paid one and a half pence to touch a piece of linen which had in turn touched the head and reputedly could cure ailments. This was a continuation of a tradition that had existed since at least the 1880s when it was claimed that the cardinal's hat that accompanied the head was a cure for headaches. In events that are difficult for many to believe in today, in 1958 it was claimed that a woman in Naples had been cured of an illness by a nun praying to the head in Drogheda over two and a half thousand kilometres away. However, this was the last step needed in getting Plunkett declared a saint. Once the Catholic Church accepted that this was a miracle, which they did, Plunkett could be canonised. While it's difficult not to be sceptical about the way people related to the head, it's worth bearing in mind that until at least the 1970s, and if not later, a majority of Irish people believed in the stories of these miracles. Through the 1960s, pressure continued to have Plunkett confirmed a saint, and to this end, pilgrimages were organised each summer to Drogheda, which attracted thousands. The way people talked about the head was very strange from a 21st century standpoint. Some claimed there was a sweet-smelling odour from it, while others talked of what they called its lovely features. It's worth bearing in mind we are after all here talking about a 300 year old head of a person who had been hanged, drawn and quartered. Ultimately the Irish Catholic Church were finally successful when Oliver Plunkett was declared a saint by Pope Paul VI in 1975. This if anything only added to the fame of the head and in 1981 on the 300th anniversary of Oliver Plunkett's execution it was flown to London for a mass which saw thousands of Irish Catholics gather at Clapham Common. That same year saw the arrival of Pope John Paul II to Ireland and obviously the head had to be brought to meet the Pope. Even in the late 20th century, Oliver Plunkett's head continued to have new meanings and associations assigned to it. In 1997, Oliver Plunkett was declared the patron saint of peace and reconciliation in Ireland during the peace process which brought the 30-year war in the north to an end. This was a striking change from how he had been used during the War of Independence and if anything illustrated the fact that Oliver Plunkett and his memory have always changed to fit prevailing attitudes at the time. Indeed, as the influence and power of the Catholic Church has faded in Ireland over the last 25 years, the way younger people relate to the head of Oliver Plunkett has changed again. It continues to attract large numbers of people to St Paul's Church in Drogheda. However, fewer and fewer are drawn for religious reasons and less still believe in the miraculous power of the head. Indeed, the Church no longer claims it was miraculously preserved. Younger generations increasingly view it as a strange, macabre relic of a bygone age and recently the parish priest at St Paul's has complained about tourists taking selfies with the head and showing general disrespect in the church. That brings an end to this episode. I'll be back next week with a return of the series Partisans. If you want to catch up on that series, you can check it out in the back catalogue. You'll see the first four episodes there, dating from December 2019. Until next time, Sloan.